Jacob Chansley, we've been following the QAnon shaman for some time here on the show, and he's been trying to get out of custody. Believe it or not, yesterday was the six month anniversary of the insurrection. It's been uh, June 6th was the date, been six months, and Jacob Chansley is still still in custody. He's the QAnon shaman. If you recall, he was the guy with the horns and sort of that entourage that was rolling through the Capitol. And they took a lot of, you know, very provocative pictures and those were spread all over the internet, sort of became a symbolic figurehead of the, the entire thing. And so he's been sitting in custody for a long time. On June 30th, we talked about on this show, a request by his attorneys to get him out of custody. Okay, this is something I've been sort of upset about for a long time here, saying that the Capitol Hill defendants are getting treated poorly and uh, disparately than some other defendants that we've seen throughout the rest of the country. And in particular, we're talking about the Antifa people, some of the BLM protesters. Many of them got right out of custody. They were released on their own recognizance. Or people like Kamala Harris were supporting bail funds that literally helped free people who burnt down the third precinct out of Minneapolis. And so major, major sort of uh, accommodations were provided to certain people from a certain political ideology to get them out of custody, work their cases through the system. And then what happens is they get diversion deals, they get plea deals, and their cases kind of get dismissed and go away. And so, okay, that, that might be fine for those particular defendants. I don't know. I don't know the nature of their cases. But simultaneously, we have to ask ourselves if, if, if a similarly situated defendant is not getting those same benefits, we have to start asking ourselves why that is. Might it be because it's a political prosecution? I think so. And we're going to see what happens here in this case. This is the third time that Jacob Chansley is trying to get out of custody, and we're going to go through this. We're going to get some background here. Of course, this is Jacob Chansley now. Uh, you know, he's not he's not in his outfit, and you know, he's he's sitting in custody. I want to remind everybody out there who says, you know, he's just a piece of garbage. He shouldn't have ever been doing. I, I okay, you can have that opinion. He's still a human being, and he is still somebody who deserves due process, the presumption of innocence, and the same standard as everybody else would, right? If this was your son or your brother or your family member, you'd want to make sure that they were being treated fairly and justly, regardless of what they did. So I can understand that perspective, but let's see, let's measure it across a standard rather than sort of prejudging the man based on the allegations. So here the article comes over from Newsweek. It says that Shaman Chansley loses the bid for freedom ahead of the Capitol riot trial. So he's on the trial road. A judge today sided with prosecutors in their quest to keep Jacob Chansley, also known as the QAnon shaman, in jail ahead of his trial for the role during the Capitol riot. One of the most well-known faces, he had the photograph with the horn headdress. In an attempt to secure his client's release from prison, we have Chansley's attorney, his name is Albert Watkins. He argued the judge's original decision was erroneous, huh? based on inaccuracies and lacking in evidence. So uh, that's an interesting approach. You know, uh, typically judges don't like that when you say, hey, that was wrong and that's inaccurate. Okay, you gotta be a little bit more careful than that. Let's see what, what else is going on here. Judge Royce Lambert disagreed with the defense. He appreciated the argument. He said in a hearing that Watkins failed to present any material evidence that wasn't available originally. And so, Essentially, what this judge is going to tell us is, thank you for asking a third time, but you didn't provide us any new information. We need, we need more than this. Now, there is some new information about what's going on, and so I do want to go through this just to show you kind of how this stuff works and how difficult it can be to sort of fight against the system. Okay, if, if the courts are going to keep somebody in custody, they're going to keep them in custody. But at the same time, we also have to ask ourselves, you know, what, what did this attorney do specifically? Did he, did he write a good motion? Did he, you know, is he, is he doing a... a an admirable job here. Let's see what we can figure out. So on June 30th, as I mentioned, we've talked about this previously on the show, there was a minute entry for a motion hearing. So they, they had a, a, a hearing in court where they were talking about whether they could release him from custody. So the motion at that time was taken under advisement, okay, with a forthcoming order. So what this means is when they all came into court on June 30th, June 30th, it was a video motion. So they were all sort of probably appearing telephonically or by video. And they're having a conversation about Jacob Chansley getting out of custody, releasing him from custody. So they make their arguments, they submit their motions, the defense submitted their motion, the, the prosecution opposed it. So the prosecution said, no, we don't want him out of custody. And then the judge listened to everything and said, well, I, I don't have an answer for you right now. I'm gonna take this under advisement and I am going to come back at a later time and give you a, a formal memorandum, which is what we have over here. So now what we can see 
is on uh, June 6, uh, July 6, which is yesterday, we have a memorandum opinion. Okay, so we have the order, first of all, which is down here. The order is denying motion, which is the motion to reopen the detention hearing and to release him from custody. So it's just a short order, and it looks like this. It says, for the reasons set forth in the accompanying memorandum, the court hereby denies Jacob Chansley's motion to reopen his hearing and release him from custody, so ordered, signed off on here by Royce C. Lamberth out of the U.S. District Court for D.C. Okay, this was filed uh, just yesterday, and it was page one of one. This is Judge Lamberth over here, of course, and then this is Jacob Chansley. So you're asking yourself, well, that's, you know, that's, there's not much there. So what else do we have? That's where we're going to take a look at the memorandum, which, of course, is over here. A couple other things I wanted to just highlight we're not going to cover. Actually, we are going to cover this. This is the status report from the U.S. Attorney's Office. And so they're going to tell us a little bit about Jacob Chansley's mental health condition because last time we talked about this he is be, he's sort of under monitoring right now uh sort of psych psychiatric evaluation and the u.s attorney's office because the government is in custody uh, it has him in their custody the government's responsible for providing the court with updates so we're going to take a look at what's going on there there's also a draft transcript uh that we're not going to look at and then there's a motion filed by Jacob Chansley's attorneys to compel some sort of disclosure. We're also not going to look at that. So let's take a quick look then at the actual memorandum. So again, this is the judge's explanation as to why Chansley is not getting out. This is the third attempt. His attorney has already tried twice. And so the third time, it's unlikely that he's going anywhere, especially if this attorney is sort of not uh, demonstrating or, or pleading new facts. If they're not going to be introducing anything new, the judge is just not going to find any differently. So let's see what this what this judge is saying. He says here, we can see this is a nine page document and we're not going to read through the whole thing. I actually clipped out some of the more boring stuff. So it's nine pages so we can roll through it relatively quickly. Once again, it says earlier this year, the court denied Chansley's motion for release. It said no conditions of release would reasonably assure the safety of the community or his appearance as required okay and so that's the standard what kind of conditions can the court impose on somebody before they let them go to make sure that they come back to court and to make sure they're not a danger to the community and now oftentimes for people don't they don't even need to do anything it's just a simple release hey do you hey you, you've never been in trouble before you've never not shown up to court you haven't so much as had a traffic ticket do you promise to come back to court Yes, I do. Okay, sign right here. You're on your way. Don't need you to do anything. Sometimes the court will make you post a bond. They'll say, hey, well, we're, we're only going to let you out if you post 25 grand. That way, if you leave, we've got some money to go get you back. And somebody says, well, that's a lot. So an attorney might come in and negotiate that down from 25,000 down to, you know, 500 or something. And so they post that. Or it's the simple fact of hiring an attorney will sometimes convince a court to, you know, release somebody. Oh, he's got counsel. He's here. He hired them. You know, we trust that firm. And so you, you, a judge may sort of change those release conditions accordingly. You can also have a release if you have, let's say, an ankle monitor, right? Or you check in with what's called pre-trial services so that you can go and actually communicate with somebody while you are out on release. You can also be sort of confined to certain areas. You can be precluded from going certain places. There are many options to ensure that people can be let out of custody. Okay, in America, remember what we talk about here? It's called the presumption of innocence. Very important concept to uh, philosophy in general and especially you know, uh, the law. But the concept is you are innocent until you're proven otherwise or until you just agree that. I'm going to go ahead and plead guilty to this thing. You don't even need to prove anything. I'm acknowledging it. But we operate on that basis that everybody starts off innocent. And so when we are in a situation like this where Jacob Chansley has been charged with several crimes, he still deserves that presumption. And that means that we should do everything humanly possible to make sure that we're not interfering with his liberty because at this moment in time, he is still innocent. Legally, we've seen the pictures, we've seen the videos, we know, but legally he is innocent. And so we have to make sure that we're protecting those liberties and not just saying, well, we all kind of saw the video, so who cares, whatever. He seems like a bad guy. We don't like his political ideology or whatever. So we're just going to throw away the keys. Nobody cares, right? That's not how this works. And the law says, supposed to say, that we do everything possible to let you out. And we only impose harsh conditions on you to make sure that you are not a danger to the community and to make sure that you show up for court. 
So they're saying it needs to be reasonably assuring the safety, reasonably assuring his appearance. And they're saying that previously when this request was made, that was not satisfied. So let's see what else is going on. Chansley then now moves the court to reopen the hearing, saying he's got new evidence and information, in quotes, discovered after the first hearing. The government opposes the motion, saying that he has not put forth any new evidence warranting the reopening. So the court ordered parties to submit briefings, so brief both sides about the issue of Chansley being a flight risk, which neither party addressed in the initial filings. Once the court received the supplemental briefs, it held a hearing, which we talked about last week. Upon consideration of the briefs, the court is going to deny Chansley's motion to reopen his case because they're saying that he has not proffered any new information that has a material bearing on the issue and whether any conditions of release would reasonably assure that he does not flee pending trial. Okay, so the judge is basically hanging his hat on that. The judge is saying we can't let him out because we don't know if he's going to flee or not. And uh, nobody briefed that anyways. So here he says, thus, even if the court were to find that Chansley has proper new information that has a material bearing on the issue of dangerousness, the court has no occasion to reconsider Chaney, uh, a Chansley's flight risk, which was an independent justification for detaining him while he awaits his trial. So it sounds like, you know, they kind of, like his attorney kind of just missed the flight risk portion of the argument. He's not a danger to the community, never been in trouble before, has a lot of good mitigation, but didn't talk about the flight risk thing. Uh-oh. Okay, let's see what else. The court assumes familiarity with the facts and the procedural history. We all saw it. There, the court found that by clear and convincing evidence that no conditions of release would reasonably assure the public safety. So let's see, ask ourselves that, right? No conditions of release could reasonably assure the public safety. So he has to stay in custody. Really? Like home detention, ankle monitoring, anything, nothing else is, is, is possible? Only incarceration? Seems pretty extreme to me. It also found by a preponderance of the evidence that no conditions of release would reasonably assure his appearance. So accordingly, the court denied the order. Goes on, he says, now, four months later, Chansley wants to reopen all of this. He says that there's new evidence. He discovered that the, after the first detention hearing, that since it showed that he would not pose a danger to the public, he said, in support of this motion, Chansley provides dozens of links to videos that he says confirm that law enforcement gave him permission to enter the Capitol building. And he, re he references that. He, the, the, the defense counsel, which is his attorney, also notes and represents that after the first detention hearing, he discovered important information about the flagpole that Chansley carried under the Capitol. Specifically, he says that the finial, which is the thing on the top of the flagpole, was affixed to the pole with a zip tie and thus could not have been used as a weapon, right? From the, this is from the motion that the defense attorney who was working for Jacob Chansley filed on his behalf, says that, oh, you know the flagpole judge that you were concerned about? Well, look, you know, it was the, uh, the, the spike at the top of the flagpole, that was just on there by a zip tie. It's just like loosely hanging there. It's not, gonna, uh, it's not going to actually injure anybody, so don't worry about that. So the judge is sort of framing that out. Now, the government responded. So remember, the way that this works is one side moves, the other side responds, and so the court is going to consider what the government has to say. We have Mr. Chansley's defense lawyer who wants him out, and we have the government who says, nope, we oppose that. They're arguing saying that he has not come forward with sufficient evidence to reopen the hearing. The government argues that if the court does reopen the hearing in the alternative, it should find that Chansley has not proven that he would not be a danger if released to the community. So we're sort of arguing about, you know, dangerousness and a flight risk. After Chansley replied, so you file a motion. So the defense files a motion. They, they move first. The government responds. And then the defense replies to the response. So the moving party gets the last word. Chansley replied. The court ordered the parties to submit supplemental briefings about the flight risk concept. In its order, the court noted that although the parties' briefs discuss at length the issue, whether any conditions of release would reasonably assure public safety, the briefs say nothing about Chansley's risk of flight. And because the court found his flight risk to be an independent justification for detaining him, the court requested the parties brief this issue as well. 
Chansley's then supplemental filing on flight risks largely rehashes many of the arguments that he made at the first hearing. He repeats he has no criminal history, okay, no passport, okay, has lived in Phoenix his entire life. Chansley also proposes the same custodian his mother previously rejected at his first detention hearing, explaining that the court is not persuaded that the defendant's mother will ensure his compliance with any conditions of release, given her repeated statements during a 60-minute interview that her son did nothing wrong. Okay, so what's going on here? The judge is not happy during the first filing that the defense lawyer didn't address the flight risk stuff. So it says, you guys got to go back out there and re-talk about that. You got to brief that issue for us. Okay, before I can let him out, I got to make sure that he's not a danger to the community and he's not going to flee. So they only talked about to the danger of the community stuff. They didn't mention the fleeing stuff. So then court says, all right, go brief that. Go write that up and bring it back to me. The attorney does that. Kind of sounds a lot like the first motion. Rehashing the first one at the first hearing talks about no criminal history, which you know doesn't really make a flight risk uh, argument. You could say so. You could say that it, a person having criminal history might make it make if you have a prior criminal record, any subsequent crime necessarily sort of aggravates the penalty because you've got priors. So you know if he had criminal history maybe this would be sort of the end of the line for him, right? So, so let's say, for example, you know, somebody who comes in and they're, they're on their seventh DUI, right? Their penalty is going to be a lot more serious than somebody on their first DUI. So they've got a lot more criminal history. If they're on their seventh DUI and they know they may be facing 10 years in prison, they, in, in my sort of you know, opinion, would have a higher risk of flight because they may just say, no, I'm out of here, right? I'm not going to show up to court because I know what's going to happen. I already did prison for my sixth DUI. Now I've got a seventh one. I know what the consequences are, so I'm just going to bail. So criminal history, I think, can actually have some flight risk impact. But this judge sort of, I think, is implying that it doesn't. No passport, I think that absolutely goes to not being a flight risk, right? He can't leave the country. He doesn't have a passport. He lives in Arizona nearly his entire life, which is where I'm living. Near, I've lived here my entire life. So shout out Arizona. What's up, Jacob? Jacob also proposes the same custodian. So his mother and the mom was out there on 60 minutes saying he didn't do anything wrong. He did nothing wrong. So the judge doesn't want to release him into her custody because who knows if she'll actually comply with anything. Chansley does offer a few new facts at the first hearing. He represented that, that his mother lives in Phoenix and that he could live with her. Now defense counsel adds that many of Chansley's close relatives also live in the area, including his grandfather, step, uh, step grandmother, uncle, brothers, defense counsel further says that if released to Phoenix, arrangements have been made for Chansley to procure mental health care from a licensed psychiatrist there. Okay. Here in Arizona. And so, this is the other aspect of this thing that I think maybe some people are overlooking is that, you know, the judge has to consider his mental health and his mental well-being. Let's see where this is going. Defense counsel also introduced new information regarding Chansley's flight risk. Counsel stated that if the court would not release to live in Phoenix, there are alternative arrangements available in secure locations in St. Louis near defense counsel's office, right? So just hey, bring him out over here with us. Defense counsel added that he would be happy to talk to the court in detail about those arrangements off the record to avoid the disclosure of names and locations. Additionally, defense counsel has arranged for Chansley to receive health care and mental health care in either Phoenix or St. Louis. So man, what a good attorney, man. That's good stuff, right? You know, maybe maybe kind of overlook some of the flight risk stuff, but that's good. You know, you say, I'm going to propose he can come here, healthcare, mental health care, kind of bending over backwards to do whatever he can to help that guy. So that's good. In response, the government maintains that Chansley has not proffered any new information. So it's basically nothing new that warrants a reopening of the proceeding. Chansley's motion with all this background is now ripe for consideration. So what happens, the judge goes through and he talks about the legal standard here about what needs to be shown in order to sort of reopen this, okay? The defense here is, is asking strongly to say, we want to reopen this. We've got a lot more stuff to explore. What do you have? Can we open this up? And the court says, well, you can, but you got to meet this standard. Certain things have to happen. And here they just don't. Let's see how he explains this in the discussion section. He says, after Chansley's first hearing, the court found by clear and convincing evidence that no conditions of release would assure the safety of the community. And the reason being, he says, Chansley's challenges to the court's initial findings on dangerousness, he says those are meaningless unless he convinced the courts 
to revisit and reverse its initial finding on the flight risk. To do so, he says, you got to have new information that has a material bearing on the issue of flight risk. Okay, so now you see these quotes here, material bearing on the flight risk. That's over from US code. So he's saying, okay, now we have a standard. This new information, does it have a material bearing? It, uh, it's, it's, it's great that, that his grandmother lives in Phoenix. Uh, it's great that you know he doesn't have a passport. It's great that whatever. But does that have a material bearing on the flight risk issue? Let's see what the judge says. He says, yeah, there was new information. None of the information, none of it has a material bearing. None of it. He says, doesn't impact the question about whether any condition or any combination of conditions could assure his appearance at trial. He said that the defense counsel first represents that his activities, especially with his mother, are, are there. He says it bears a logical connection to the issue, but not a material bearing. Instead, he, he talks about the Bail Reform Act. The court has to consider something that actually affects the court's inquiry. He says this information does not. Family ties do not mitigate any of the other concerns the court identified. Ooh, I don't know about that. I think I disagree with the judge on that one, my friends. Family's very important, right? His whole family's here. I would tend to side on the side of release there, right? Release him to the family. He says the family has no material bearing on it. Does not actually affect, yeah. Okay, well, those, he says, uh, those include Chan Chansley's ability to travel long distances. <laughs> okay. He says, family ties do not mitigate any of the other concerns. So the judge is saying, listen, yeah, the family's there, but so what? Chan Chansley can still travel long distances using untraceable methods. And his ability to quickly raise large sums of money for travel through non-traditional sources. Wow. Chansley's family say they have not prevented him from traveling undetected in the past. The court is unpersuaded. They will prevent him from doing it in the future. So it sounds like, it sounds like the family has maybe had an issue with this previously. Like they've had custody of Chansley, but maybe he's just left without their permission. So the judge doesn't have any faith. I'm not sure that that's, what he's saying, but it sort of seems like we can glean that from that. Moreover, Chansley maintains that if he's released to Phoenix pending trial, he would return home to live with his mother. But the court already rejected that arrangement as insufficient, and he did not propose a new custodian. But he also sort of mentioned his lawyer. For these reasons, the family ties to Phoenix do not have a material bearing on the court's flight risk analysis, which I totally disagree with that. Absolutely disagree with that. I think that family is very important. I think that uh, he would be well served to be with his family rather than being in custody. What the judge is talking about here is sort of trying to predict the future or like look into a crystal ball and sort of analyze all of the different permutations. Yes, it is possible that he could quickly raise large sums of money for travel. Sure, no question. Uh, there's all, it, it, it is also possible that he could travel long distances using untraceable methods. Yes, we got that. It's also possible that a meteorite slams into the side of the prison and he just walks right out the front door. You know, I don't know. So there's a lot of possibilities here. And when judges start playing this game, well, well, this is possible and this could happen and this could happen and this could happen. Yeah, we can do that all day long, all day. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the presumption of innocence. You don't get to sit there and come up with a bunch of reasons as to why somebody should not be released from custody when I think personally, a family is a very safe place to release somebody into custody. Okay, especially if you've got a big family like that. You got a number of people all coming into court saying, we're, help we're here to help. We're here to help. We'll take care of them, right? You're a judge. You say, yes, because of the presumption of innocence, because of the family support. This makes sense. We don't want him to sit in custody. Not this judge, though. Nor, he says, does defense counsel's passing reference to a secure location matter? Understandably, defense counsel stated that he would not provide further details, but since the hearing, which took place nearly a week ago, defense counsel has not provided any information to the court reg regarding that secure location. Oh, no. That attorney just got thrown under the bus right there. Oh. That's a bummer. All right. Without information on the arrangements that have been made, the court is unable to assess whether this release plan would reasonably assure Chansley's appearance as required. The court said, well, I was going to listen to your argument, but 
You didn't send me any of that follow-up information there. <laughs> not good, not good. Oh, no, that's terrible. All right, finally, while the court takes seriously defense counsel's representation that Chansley's mental health has declined while in jail, the fact that arrangements have been made for Chansley to obtain mental care in Phoenix or St. Louis does not have a material bearing on the issue so the guy's having a mental breakdown in there it, he's suffering and we're saying hey we've got some pretty good uh, resources out here uh, your honor that we can just sort of you know get him plugged into with his family with some psychiatrists anywhere maybe that should have a material bearing on his release conditions and and it sounds pretty reasonable to me but the judge just says yeah but that has nothing to do with the bearing on his flight risk because what does that have to do with that well, the opposite argument, of course, is going to be that, well, if he if he gets proper medical tra uh, treatment and care, maybe some of the underlying mental health problems that led to the underlying crime in the first place would be dealt with. Maybe this would be something that he can actually be rehabilitated rather than just sort of punished and allowed to descend into ever worse conditions. No material bearing, said this judge. Okay. Uh, on the issue, he says, the court did not consider the mental health when evaluating his risk of flight, which, of course, if somebody is, I think, in, in good mental health, maybe they don't have a risk of flight, whereas somebody who's not thinking clearly may have a risk of flight. So you can see how they're logically, how medical care might be useful. Instead, as noted above, the court pointed to Chansley's ability to travel long distances using untraceable methods. Court finds that that no conditions of release would reasonably assure his appearance. And he says, in sum, Chansley has not provided any new information that has a material bearing on the issue. Without this showing, the court will not revisit its prior finding. Accordingly, the court must deny Chansley's motions. Signed off here July 6th by Royce Lamberth, United States Court District Judge. Man. <sighs> That's a tough, that's a tough day for Chansley and his lawyer, candidly. All right, so here is the final document that I wanted to share with you. As we heard about, Chansley is still in custody. He is still suffering from mental, uh, you know, issues that, that are needing to be addressed. As I explained, because he is in government custody, the government has responsibility for that. So they have to provide a status update. They did that also yesterday. They say the government submits this update. Since the last update, the defendant remains housed in FCI Englewood in Littleton, Colorado. He's going to undergo his competency evaluation. The parties have been providing the appropriate information to the evaluator, and the government does not have any additional updates as to the status at that time. So he's basically just, you know, sitting in there, just wasting away. <sighs> And the judge is not going to let him out. So let's see what's going on with the uh, with the court or with the uh, not the courts. I read I read a statement over at locals watching the watchers locals dot com. All right. Let's see who who is uh, in the house. We've got Sharon Quinn. He says he is a political prisoner. Do you seriously expect him to get any kind of break at all? I mean, I was hopeful, honestly, you know, it's. This whole this whole thing, I think, has really been a uh, a real big black eye on the criminal justice system, and a really big black eye more more so. We the, the the justice system has a lot of black eyes. We can all acknowledge that. What I have seen from sort of the criminal defense bar, a lot of these criminal lawyers out there who say, "Oh, we're going to represent everybody. We'll we'll represent whom who, anybody anywhere, no matter what." Not much from them, right? Not a lot of people are coming to the aid of these people who are in custody, and it is a sad, sad thing. So it, I, I was hopeful that maybe our country had not descended into that quite yet, but I am, uh, of course, not surprised. Arizona, uh, you know, want to know, let's see if I can get this going. Want to knows here, says uh, Arizona people need to watch out for, plus it's far from D.C. courts. Yeah, so talking about, I think, them expanding their their presence all over the place we have relic hunter here says this should be reopened please this is terrifying yeah it is a scary thing joe snow says this is all terrifying there is no more justice there is no more liberty there is no more press that comes from joe snow we have uh relic hunter says this is inhumane the jeremy matrita says should it shouldn't a judge use the reasonable person test just because something is possible does not mean it is probable chansley will likely become homeless yeah that happens a lot that happens a lot. You know, people, everything just sort of gets stripped away from him. Now, listen, you know, Jacob Chansley is somebody who's got an attorney. Thankfully, a lot of people don't. A lot of people get, you know, public defenders, which are, which can be amazing attorneys. I'm not belittling them at all. They're amazing attorneys. Uh, but it's, 
you know, he's got a lot of eyeballs on this. For, for every Jacob Chansley, there are thousands of people who are also just sitting in custody that nobody even thinks about. Just, oh, well, whatever, right? That guy did this. This guy did this. He's, he's a drug addict. He's a rapist. He's somebody. And they're, they're people with mental problems. They just get thrown in the back of a jail cell and just forgotten about. So this hap you know, this is symbolic of a sort of a, a deeper problem, I think. Certainly he's a political prisoner, but there are a lot of people who are also sort of at the, at the receiving end of a tyrannical government. And that's why I get so passionate about these issues. I just, you know, I, I can't, we have, we have a lot of bullies in this country in our legal justice system, and I, I'm not happy about it. Relic Hunter says, everyone is a flight risk according to this judge's judgment. Yeah, uh, th so this judge is actually a pretty conservative judge, if I read that correctly. And, um, you know, a lot of conservative judges are, gonna, are going to be very tough on crimes. We've got three girlies in the house says, anyone put in, seg or in uh, segregation or protected custody could end up with mental health issues 23 hours in a cell is inhumane. That's from three girlies. Good to see you, three girlies. Nadarb says, "What the f is a material? What is a material bearing even mean?" And so, if you if you read the discussion, I'm sorry, the the, the legal standard section of that opinion, you'll you'll see what the judge goes into. But it, it's sort of something that has to be of consequence, right? It, it it has to be something meaningful. It can't just be sort of random new information. And just like anything in the law, right, it's open to interpretation. So a judge can sort of interpret it any which way they want. Uh, we have, let's see here. Uh, Joe Snow says, what you got in your pockets right now? My last PD. Oh, no, that's uh, that's terrible. Yeah, that's that's awful. I've never I've never uh, seen that. Public defenders are amazing attorneys. Rob, stop, dr stop drinking the clown world Kool-Aid. So I don't know about your public defenders, Joe, but I, I, you know, I do know a lot of good public defenders. I know a lot that are not that great also, but I know many of them that are, are quite good. And some of them, you know, do good work with great trainings and things like that. So I never like to, to, to talk badly about the public defenders. They're on the right side. As long as you're on the right side of the line, you're good in my book. I got nothing bad to say about the public defenders. Prosecutors though, all right. Great questions all coming in from over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Thank you, everybody, for your continued support over there. And as you know, if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona that is facing criminal charges, we would love the opportunity to help at our law firm, the r, &R Law Group. We're dedicated to helping good people get amazing results in their cases. And one of the most important things that we want to do is make sure that they feel that they have safety, clarity, and hope in their cases. Our phone number is 480-787-0394. We're online at rrlawaz.com. We can help with any type of criminal case in the state of Arizona, DUIs, domestic violence, traffic violations, uh, drug offenses, all sorts of offenses, including removing mugshots off the internet and helping to clear up old records like old warrants and restoring your right to vote and possess a firearm again. There's a lot that we can do to help. We're super passionate about the work that we do and we would love the opportunity to, to speak with somebody and see what we can do to help. If you don't need any legal services, that's a good thing. You may want some informational offerings though. I have available at gumroad.com slash Robert Gruler, a law enforcement interaction training. It's a two and a half hour training. That is, uh, it's, it's, uh, we, I, I, th I had fun. I think that the other people there had a good time as well. And we were talking about the one, two, three rule for dealing with law enforcement. So specifically, there's only one rule. It's the one, two, three rule. Number two, the two questions that law enforcement can ask you that you have to respond to. And then number three, the three response answers that you can use if they ask you an inappropriate question. Very useful stuff. Check that out over at gumroad.com slash Robert Gruller. And don't forget to check out some of our other channels and links down in the description below. And I would also, I, I'm asking for a lot, but I would love, love a subscribe if you have not done so already.